The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're in Romans chapter 3. We broke into that chapter Sunday, and we will pick up with verse 3 in your notes. Once again, this is our opportunity to take a pause and to check ourselves and be sure that we are in fellowship, regardless of what's going on around us and in the world. Uh, these things will take care of themselves. We have Bible doctrine to help us through everything, if we will use it. And so we have this time together to receive this information that God has seen fit to preserve for the edification of positive volition. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, your mercies are renewed to us each and every day. We thank you that you are faithful and remain the same, and your word is perfect. We thank you that we can be here and that we can be encouraged by eternal verities and get our eyes off of the things of the cosmos and on the great plan of which we are privileged to be a part of. Bless our time together in these matters. In Christ's name, amen. All right, uh, the first two chapters, in a nutshell, are devoted to the indictment of the Gentiles and the second chapter, the indictment of the Jews, to establish the fact that all are boxed in under sin. All right? Therefore, all are fall short of the glory of God and cannot attain human level of righteousness that would qualify them to have an eternal relationship with God. But after, you know, taking the Jew to the spiritual woodshed where he exposes that their self-righteousness is hollow, that they are guilty of the same kinds of sins, uh, that the Gentiles that they constantly judge and look down on are guilty of. They're guilty too. And furthermore, they have not, they have not taken advantage of their advantages, a lot of them. He's dealing with the unbelieving crowd. They have not taken advantage of their advantages. And their advantage was they were given the law, they were given the oracles of God as we saw last time, and they were entrusted with this, and corporately, they dropped the ball real big time. They really did by their rejection of their Messiah and their failure to use the law properly. They were therefore, for all of their overtness uh, and about the law and how great it was and everything, the Jew was a transgressor of the law. Because of the failure to, go, to use the law properly, they misused it, and the law not only defines sin, it does that, the whole purpose of which is to convict the reader thereof that they are a sinner and in need of forgiveness and are not good enough, could never be good enough to merit a relationship with God forever. This is, this is the strictness of God's plan. Those who he brings into his plan must possess the same righteousness he possesses. So it has to be, it has to be another way and not by the works of the law, by any amount of ritual or religiosity, cannot accomplish and climb that mountain. You remember when the uh, Jews were uh, given the law on Sinai and Moses and his assistant Joshua went up to the mountain? The rule was this. The mountain was off limits to anyone else. 
They put a barrier around it and put guards out there with weapons, bows and arrows, so that if any person, everyone was told, if any person tries to cross that barrier or even merely touch the mountain, they were to be executed. What? What was that about? It was to teach them in the beginning that salvation, you can't climb that mountain of, and, and attain to the righteousness of God. The law was never intended as an instrument. Do these things and you'll be saved. In fact, in another place in Galatians, get this, if you remember, Paul said that if salvation could be through a system of works, something that was readily attainable for the average person, salvation would have been by works. But that's out because no system of works merit equals plus R, absolute righteousness. So this is where the early going in Romans is to get these Christians and everybody established firmly that in order to have an eternal relationship with God, you have to have something imputed to you and I that, make, get, that, that uh, is the equivalent of plus R, absolute righteousness. That's the doctrine of the uh, justification by faith. So there is another way, uh, the, the, the other way, the other way is, you know, peril written all over it and the lake of fire. This other way is a grace way, but we haven't quite got there. Now, in this section, addressing potential misconceptions. First, concerning the Jews. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect, in every way. First of all, <coughs> excuse me, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Paul does not want his readership to think that the Jew doesn't have any advantage and, and that circumcision uh, was worthless. It's the abuse of these things that makes it bad. Circumcision, of course, was a ritual uh, to uh, point to spiritual circumcision. Spir circumcision by the Spirit. The isolation, this is one aspect of salvation, probably, well, you have here. I know you have. But this is one aspect of salvation that you probably won't hear mentioned. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, their STA is isolated. For the first time in their history, it is not a, it is not a solid line of rulership of the STA. Now, I have to explain rulership of the STA doesn't mean that people are doing god-awful things constantly. <laughs> uh, people do good things. People uh, uh, have a conscience and they follow it, unbelievers. But they are still under the rulership of this STA. The rule of the STA, this solid line is broken at the point that the individual believes in Christ. It's analogous to circumcision. More on that coming up in Romans. So circumcision had its place as a ritual for the dispensation of Israel. The uncircumcised man can be circumcised of soul. And as Paul said, can judge rightly the circumcised person who does not have spirit circumcision, who has not believed for salvation, believed in the Messiah, past or present, depends on where you're at in history. Jewish unbelief notwithstanding, verses 3 and 4. What then? The uh, interrogative tis with the conjunction gar. If some did not believe, <clears throat> their unbelief will not cancel or nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? This, this, this question uh, demands an answer. Uh, uh, a negative answer in this case. Uh, okay, we have a first-class condition. Uh, if some did not believe, 
uh, we have the verb pistuo with the alpha privative on it, apistuo, refuse to believe. If some did not believe, <clears throat> some is the indefinite pronoun tis, uh, it will not, if some did not believe, not believe is, is there's no negative here because it's the verb incorporates them, sorry. It means refuse to believe. And then uh, we have a negative that goes with the verb nullify. It doesn't seem to be uh, in place here because nullify is the last word in the, in, uh, will not, their unbelief. Well, th let's do with their unbelief. That's the noun. We have, we have pistis. We have the noun apistia. Apista. And that means unbelief. Their unbelief will not cancel, nullify, at some point down the road, future active indicative, kat or geo, nullify the faithfulness. We have the word for faith, pistis. But when used of God, it's not the faith of God. God doesn't have to exercise faith, okay? Uh, we do. Uh, it, it, when used with, in connection with God, it's his faithfulness, pistis. If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? And then we have the Greek. I'll, re, I'll give you the Greek. Meganoito. Me, meganoito, me, uh, translated, may it never be. It's an expression Paul used of abhorrence. It is an expression with a negative, with the aorist optative, deponent optative of the verb to become genomai, with a negative. It is found 10 times in Romans. We'll see it again and again. It's found in Luke, uh, 1 Corinthians, and three times in Galatians. Except for the Luke passage, it is a Pauline expression. If he wanted to discount something, he may use this expression, uh, may it never be. Rather, <clears throat> Let God be true, present, passive, imperative. Let God be, genomai, the God, be true, alethes, the adjective. Though all, every man, singular, anthropos, a liar, sustes, just as it is written. Perfect passive indicative grapho for a quotation from the Old Testament. The quotation, that's why it's all in caps here. It's the way they, the way they feature it in the New American Standard. Quotations from the Old Testament are all put in caps. That you, God, may be justified. Uh, that, you may, that you may be justified, eris passive subjunctive, dekaio, justify, acquit, in your words, in with the definite article, logos, and prevail, future active indicative, nikao means to prevail, be victorious, when you are judged, definite article, present active infinitive of crino. All right. The question, what then? is provoked by the issue of the unbelief of some Jews. As it will turn out in human history, it's a lot of Jews. Many, many, many Jews through time exited this life in a state of unbelief. Unbelieving Jews, the racially chosen people in unbelief. of some Jews with respect to the oracles of God, which clearly anticipated these oracles, uh, incremental oracles are revealed through various individuals. These oracles, when you search through them, clearly anticipated a coming savior. I mean, it's very clear in there. I, I've, I understand how, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I think we had a Bible laying around the house out in the ranch. I try to pick it up and read it around Christmas time. 
I thought maybe that's something you ought to do. <laughs> I had no idea. I, I might as well be reading Swahili almost. I, I needed a guide and I needed one bad. I didn't read it and pick up stuff. And not having any kind of religious training, maybe that was a good thing. Nevertheless, Paul had religious training. He overcame it, the wrong kind. I didn't have a clue, not a clue. Naturally, as a person and a kid growing up, I'm into the, you're rewarded for doing good things and you're punished for doing bad things. So I related that to God. Well, I knew nothing about grace and forgiveness, nothing. And I had obviously heard of Jesus Christ. He was born in Bethlehem in a manger and went on a cross and supposed to be resurrected. I didn't know anything about the simplicity of salvation for the individual and the clarity of it. But there's always a time and place for everything to happen. God kept me alive, so I got that message in a fundamentalist Baptist church in St. Louis, Missouri, when I was a sophomore in high school. And so my quest and my search, I began to, find, uh, I began to hit what I needed, made the big step. But imagine being raised up as a Jew, going to synagogue, before that, the temple, in that whole society with all of its history, all of its traditions, and missing the mark that far. Having this flipped on its head, the Jews had it, you can read their history in the Old Testament, and all their ups and downs, but you should have been able to find out in those scriptures that they read in synagogue that the Messiah was going to come, and before he would reign in all of his glory, he was going to be suffered. He was going to suffer and be rejected. That's the irony of it all. Had the Jews been on board and the leadership been on board with these scriptures, they would have never crucified him. They would have never instigated it. So there you are. God didn't make some negative. Those that saw Jesus were around Jesus. They, could, they knew what the credentials of a Messiah was. So they could ferret out any false messiahs saying that they're a messiah. Uh, are you born, uh, were you born, uh, according to the prophecy in Micah, uh, were you born in Bethlehem? Are you the tribe of Judah? Or, uh, does your family tree go back to King David in the genealogies? Et cetera, et cetera. Is your mother a virgin when she got pregnant? Supernaturally? On and on. They, they, they knew this as, as academic information. They knew when Jesus was there, the high priest, Caiaphas, and that crowd, they knew he was the Messiah. You say, well, why, are these, why weren't they saved? Because they wouldn't believe in him and embrace him as such. It's mind-boggling, but it's what it is. And the Jews have carried this unbelief all through these centuries to the present time. The exceptions do exist. And Jews today, are some of them are coming around in Israel. And there will be the biggest turnaround after the rapture. When blindness, spiritual blindness, is removed from Jacob. Jacob is a term. He was the father of the 12th tribe, so that's, a, that's a, uh, another word to, to describe uh, Israel, Jacob. In fact, Israel was Jacob's new name. God named him Israel after his, his, his family named him Jacob, and uh, God gave him this special name, uh, Israel, which means Prince of God. Anyway, <clears throat> the negative volition of the chosen pe people, or the, which clearly anticipated, excuse me, excuse me, <clears throat> my throat, a coming Savior, and what was required to make the salvation adjustment. All they had to do was search the scriptures with an open mind, and uh, 
the coming of Christ, there were individuals who had it right. They didn't go for the crowd and the, and the mass stupidity. It's the same thing today, people. It's the same thing today. People embrace this, all these different kinds of things. And, oh, it's great. And someone comes along and presents the facts. And people dig their little heels in. Pray to God that whatever, if you are in any way, and I'm not talking about salvation. You got that right. You can still learn something or be refreshed. And what was required to make the salvation adjustment? Paul will get into that with, and use, and, and who, are we gonna, who are we gonna use as the example for the Jews? Oh, of course, we're gonna use Abraham. He's the founding father. He's revered by the Jews. Abraham, our father. Okay, he is your natural, historical ancestor. But you're not acting like him. You don't have, the, you don't have up here what he had up there and did what he did. We have Abraham. That's a, that was their boast to Jesus, their fake boast to Jesus, their hollow boast. No. Satan is your father. Satan, and that's not just being mean speech, okay? Just try to stir people up to just say you're satanic just because you're mad at somebody. No, Satan is your father. Satan was all of our fathers when we were born physically. He's our spiritual father, but we got adopted into the plan of God because our volition believed in Jesus Christ. The best, the best moment of your life always will be the time, whether you can remember the day or the hour, like the funny, can you remember the day and the hour? Uh, I can remember when, when I was. I, I can't tell you the date on the calendar right now. But it doesn't matter. I just know what I believed initially. The negative volition of the chosen people did not any fa in any fashion invalidate the Jewish privilege. More on that coming up later, later down the road in Romans. So the Gentiles don't cut some weird idea that God has thrown Israel off permanently and completely, and there's no, no, no need to talk about the promised land and the Jewish people per se, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's part of uh, Reformed theology, that the church inherits all the promises of Israel. The church and Israel are two separate entities. We're talking about the redeemed church and, the, and redeemed Israel, not the fake church and, not, not, and false Jews. The second question in verse 3 has to do with the integrity, faithfulness of God. We expect a negative answer. And Paul supplies the answer with the formula, may it never be. Six, in his present form, it indicates his abhorrence of the very suggestion. Seven, the obvious and most reasonable view in the foregoing question is the unbelief of the Jews in Paul's day, and of course, all the way down to our day, but anyway, in Paul's day, exhibited by the rejection of Jesus as Messiah, and consequently, negative volition to the oracles of God that foretold his coming. Eight, the basis for the understanding that the Jews of his day are in view is the context where Paul is addressing the unbelieving Jews, chapter 2, verse 17 and following, or the unbelieving Jew. Paul is careful not to include all Jews in this category, he says, if some did not believe. The argument thus far is, the negative volition of the Jews does not invalidate the privilege of the Jew in possession of the oracles of God over the Gentile. That still stands. If a bunch of Jews fall spiritually, permanently, that doesn't change any of that. But of, e but of even greater importance is that the unbelief of the Jews does not undermine God's integrity. I'll, I use that as a synonym for his faithfulness, part of his integrity. A part of human integrity is honesty, reliability, you know, those kind of things. As seen in verse 3, under the word, the faithfulness of God, the pistis of God. God is true to his word, regardless of the negative volition of the many. Always recognize that. How many times have we seen this in the Bible? Ex 
there are times when there is a mass positive volition of people. But there are other times when it's few. And we should not get our eyes on that. He in no way is influenced by human opinion, God is not, and mass negative volition, even among the chosen race. He is unaffected by this, not in the least. The God is faithful to his spoken word, no matter how many people reject it. <clears throat> because we are the few, the chosen, the few as compared to the world of unbelievers, all the Christians you might have on earth at any given time, are still the few. The many are the masses out here that are in a state of unbelief that we are commissioned to present the gospel to as God opens doors. Because we don't know among them who's going to turn to the Lord and get saved. But, the, but, but, but we're outnumbered. Christians are. So positive Christians, adjusted Christians, are also way outnumbered. There's, there's sufficient documentation in Scripture for this. Putting forward the absurd suggestion, verse 3, Paul forcefully asserts for the second time the formula of disavowal, may it never be. Then Paul says, rather, let God be true, found true and every man a liar. 17, by asserting the extreme case of universal negative volition or unbelief, it serves to highlight the fact that human consensus does not overturn God's faithfulness to his promises, his word, its content, and the true doctrines thereof. He is completely unaffected by it. And so should we be unaffected by those who are negative, those who turn away from the truth, we should be totally unaffected as if there was a thousand of us here. Of course, we couldn't fit in here. But I'm just saying, we should be unaffected by that. Eighteen, nothing extraneous to his person. <clears throat> Can negate, overturn his word or will. It's been all this way through history. Look at all the negative volition before the flood. 120 years of listening to Noah, it didn't change these people. The same little family got on that ark and survived, which is an illustration of salvation, and those that drowned is an illustration of those that perish in their sins. So you have to reassure, you got to reassure yourself with the fact that it isn't, it isn't a numbers game. God desires that all be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's a truism. That's his, that's his will, wish, or desire for everybody. But that's up to the individual and their volition. Yes, at times and places, you'll see an outbreak of positive volition. You will see it. You saw it with the Assyrians under Jonah. You saw it with the Samaritans, the despised Samaritans. And they were goofy, too. They were trying to... Uh, uh, claim the, the privileges of the Jew because they had a temple and they, had, they, they took the Old Testament as the word of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and believed that there was a coming Messiah and so forth. Because the woman at the well, she reveals this. And Jesus basically said, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about. You Samaritan. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I paraphrase it. He, he wasn't being mean to her. You, you people don't know what you're doing. Israel was given the promises of God. They're there because God put them there. Now, they're in a state of unbelief, but they were the chosen race, not the Samaritans. But it was that village where, boom, all this positive volition suddenly broke out. You never know when you're going to have a break out of that. But we have no control over that. The point here is, if everyone disagrees, God is true, his word stands tall, and he will be vindicated 
when he is judged. At the end, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. People you would think, and, and it isn't because he's going to force it out of their mouths. He's going to make, make someone do something they didn't want to do. But it's too late. So again, nothing extraneous to his person can negate his word or will. The divine attributes of immutability, justice, veracity, and righteousness remain inviolate, even if every man is found out to be a liar on the wrong side of the truth. A liar is someone who is propagating information that is untrue biblically, that is not of God, like the Jews were doing by teaching their salvation by works mess. That they had a big advantage over the Gentiles because they had the law, they had circumcision, they had all these rituals, and, and they, in a way they had an advantage, but they fumbled it on the one yard line when they could have won the Super Bowl. And it wasn't a fumble because of a hard hit. It was just sloppiness. They dropped it. The citation of Psalm 51.4 in this connection presents some difficulty because of the different situation in which David spoke these words and how they are used here. The whole verse reads, David is, this is one of those psalms, of which there's a number of them, that have as its backdrop his uh, involvement with a married woman by the name of Bathsheba and the murder of her husband and all and the divine discipline he came under as a believer at the high point of his kingly career he is brought low by sickness, physical sickness. He was, he, was a very, he was a very strong, powerful man. And he was reduced, and, and, and the, word got, the word spread everywhere that he'd committed these twin major violations of the Ten Commandments. Murder and, and adultery. And how did he recover from this? How do you recover? How do you recover from a minor sin? Well, you just name it and move on. Confess it to God and walk off. Yeah, and strive to do better and not repeat it. But if you do, rebound and keep going. That's what you would tell anybody, right? And it applies to every sin. Not in some circles. <laughs> and not in some... Christian persuasions, like the Puritans, you're going to be required to wear a, an A around your neck. No, you think that's crazy. That was oppressive. I mean, really oppressive. Where did the grace come from in those people? This woman did that. She was always among the Puritans of old. I don't know, up there in Massachusetts and wherever. <laughs> they were treated real bad. I saw it in a church I was in. And it was just a, a young couple that had sex before married, right before married, and, they, and she got pregnant, and, 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 then they, and, they, and they right away got married. They wouldn't let up on her. And I didn't know the doctrine anywhere close to what I know now, but it ticked me off. In my soul, I was saying, enough is enough. You wanna run them through this ringer? You're pathetic. I didn't have the, I didn't have the, oh, I, 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 did, I, I have the doctrine now. I know the doctrine. You overcome sins of the flesh by a rebound. This, and this will be taken by some to say that I'm giving you a license to sin. That's slander. I'm giving you a license to serve God. It happens to be that way. Your sins may not be the same as another believer's sins, but they're still sins, and they knock you out of fellowship. And yeah, and I realize that some sins carry a higher weight than others. I recognize that. But have you sat down and tried to figure out what those were? How about slander and gossip? Maligning. Sins of the tongue. 
verbal sins. How about them? And there's mental attitude sins that can kill you too. Judge not lest you be judged. You do a righteous judgment, that's fine. Somebody did something, that was wrong. You see it and observe it objectively. That's, that's a righteous judgment. But formulating something about someone without the facts, just be patient. You can, you can have, it looks this way and so forth, it may or may not be. But in any case, where you're not sure, just leave it alone. The whole verse reads, against you, David is confessing his sin. And he's, and he's doing it in a psalm. He does it in Psalm 32 as well. But he was inspired later on down the road to write a psalm about this. A psalm. Something that they would sing. That's what psalms mean. Songs. They were incorporated into the uh, so-called hymnal of Israel. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Okay, the obvious stuff. All sin, first and foremost, is directed against God. Even though others are sinned against and hurt by our actions. First and foremost, the sin is against God. Sin is a violation of God's righteousness. Over a period of, a lot of years, a person has this accumulation of sins that they have committed. They are in need of forgiveness. When you got saved, all your sins up to that point, blotted out. They're not even taken into consideration. Same thing for rebound. Now, there are people that won't want, want to let you forget, but that's their STAs. Don't let them intimidate you. Then, then you, you become a victim of not applying Bible doctrine. Yeah, I did that. But it's yesterday. Now, what do you want to do with your yesterdays? Well, I didn't do that. So what? Therefore, God's judgments upon men for their sins are always just and righteous. People sin, and God's resp God responds with judgments that fit the offense. There are, there's, a, there's a bunch of variety of factors involved here. And uh, I don't know if I can articulate them correctly, but if you rebound quick, you're less apt to get nailed down the road. You don't want to step into the Lord's table out of fellowship. I don't care what you did Saturday night. The day before. God brings judgments against believers for their sins, and we call that divine discipline. Guess what? When you are, when a believer is under divine discipline, God's jamming them for something. It could be their health. It could be any number of things. Finances. All kinds of stuff. You are blessed. Blessed is the person whom the Lord disciplines. It's an act of love and a corrective act. He's trying to bring you up and you're a child of God and you are, I know it sounds weird to say you are blessed. There's the divine discipline uh, for believers. Then where believers will not rebound, repent or whatever, they just grind on with it and to the sin unto death. People sin and God's responds with judgments that fit the offense. The cycle of sin and wrath validates God's word as per that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Sin against God is an occasion for the vindication and exhibition of divine justice. Well, if that's true, this world's in a big way of hurt coming up. The storm hasn't hit yet. Oh, it's hitting. You read about or hear about it all the time. Weather events, other kinds of events, 
coming against the human race. This is, I would call, warning discipline, but they're not taking it to heart. That big cold snap we had in the ice storm before, we'll bring it right down to home. We don't have to go, we don't have to, go to uh, some other country. All around, this is hitting. Those birth pains. But most people, and in people's personal lives, bad stuff is happening, whether they have money or not. Bad stuff's happening. And very few are using these things as a goad to head them towards God and his word. And I might add, you know, for all of you here, don't let anybody drag you down spiritually. If you don't have your armor on and you're not going to stand firm, you're going to be a casualty. The odds aren't in your favor, but you can do it. That's an aside. God, sin does not disestablish the character of God, just as unbelief of the many cannot void the truth of God. In a world of sin and unbelief, God will eventually be vindicated. Everything in his word will be vindicated. Out in the open. They can mock it. They can ignore it. They can do whatever they want to do. They can say, well, I don't believe that. I've had, I've, I've, had, I've had to deal with that over the years. Well, give me your detailed refutation then. I just don't agree the U.S. is in prophecy. You don't. Most, the most recent one, you don't know who the Antichrist is. I sure as hell do. We'll see. And those of us who stay on the right side through prayer and diligence and stay on the right side of the truth, we, along with God, will be validated and vindicated in a way you can't even imagine. That's what I'm, that's what I'm working towards, and I want for you too. In a world of sin and unbelief, God will be justified, vindicated, and he, see that one, that God may be justified, and then with the word prevail, it's a future act indicative, and he will prevail because he's omnipotent, and he's the truth, and he will overturn all this in the face of contradiction and opposition. He's going to take on the world like never before with the Day of the Lord events. And none of these people running around out here are going to be able to go hide behind their favorite form of entertainment or, 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 some, or some stimulant or, or their monetary physical details. They're not going to, it's not going to make them happy because it's going to be about survival. But it's real easy, well, not easy. On the one side, the spiritual side's easy. Believe in Jesus Christ. Now you're not going to go to hell in the lake of fire. Got that, got that covered. Now, as far as the, the other side of it is just find the best information through prayer, like we all do. What do you, what's, a, what's your will for me, geographical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that I can end my phase two with honor and get the reward associated therewith. And if I die in the trip, fine. But I don't want to die in dishonor. I'm still going to heaven, but I, I want to die with honor. I want to die in your will. So you can see today, it's just, I mean, it's sad. It's the, 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 the negative volition and the people are clueless. And a lot of Christians got it so screwed up, it isn't funny. Even those that believe in the coming of the Lord. They got all the, I, I, I see some of it. I'm not, I, I, I'm aware of it. Oh, you got that right. Well, that's all messed up. And it matters. It matters. Well, who cares whether you know who the Antichrist is? See, I, I hear this kind of mess. I care because it's in God's word. And he must care about it. And I want to know what I need to know. So I can know it personally and rejoice in it and meditate on it and I can share it with you. So you don't have to sit around and be miserable 24-7 because you just watch the news. Well, that's your divine discipline. Just kidding. <laughs> listen, to this, listen to this pathetic stuff. It's not going to get better. You can grind your teeth over it all day long. It isn't going to get any better. 
they will, to use the old English expression, wax worse and worse all the way down the ladder. We're in the last days. You expect a big upturn in righteousness suddenly? This country's lost its mind. It's lost its way. They don't care. Its leaders are corrupt, like the ones that were in Babylon when Daniel was in the end of his career. I've had it. It's just like the prophecy says. The restrainer is no longer restraining, and evil is running amok. Just pray that we can continue to meet and take in Bible doctrine. However, um, however many of us decide we're going we're gonna to stay the course. Again, far from distracting from the integrity of God. Now, this will kind of shock. It, 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 at first hearing, it, it might, it causes people to run it. Run. Sin is an occasion to promote his faithfulness when the appropriate judgment is rendered. How does sin magnify the character of God? We'll talk about that tomorrow night. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen.